Today we have another special lineup beginning this morning with Yuko Oda, who is our plenary speaker this morning. Professor Oda is a professor at the New York Institute of Technology in the School of Fine Arts. She is an artist with an incredible range of abilities, working in sculpture, painting, and drawing, as well as 3D animation, video, and interactive media. Professor Oda received her BA with distinction in studio art and philosophy from Duke University, and her MFA from the Rhode Island School of Design. She has studied and exhibited work in Spain and in her home country of Japan. She is not only a stunning artist, but a scholar who studies the impact of technology on the fine arts. In 2009, she was a curator of the Seagraph Art Gallery. That is the largest digital art show in the world. She served as the curator for that show. Her presentation this morning will focus on exploring contemporary art and how it responds to some of our most challenging questions. Questions about social, environmental, political, and economic issues. And I think we just convinced Dr. Oda to please give us a little bit about herself as well and show some of her art. So we're looking forward to a fabulous presentation. Please join me in welcoming Professor Yuko Oda. I'm honored to be here this morning to speak with you about technology and art. I titled this talk a glimpse because an hour is not enough time to provide you with a thorough overview of the history and contemporary uses of technology in the arts. But let us try. Never before has there been a, such a rapid succession of changes in the way we perceive, process, and send information. And our way of community, the communication is in constant flux transforming so rapidly that some moments, like this very moment, we can feel technology and communication evolving. At this constant transformation of technology, we can see that it has revolutionized the way we make, perceive, and contextualize art. So in this image, you can see an image by, does anyone know who this is? Thank you, yes. George Surratt, uh, this is a painting from 1880 and what he did that was revolutionary was using points of color to deconstruct an image. So from afar, it looks like a garden with people spending their Sunday afternoon, but from up close, you see points of color. The second image, can anybody guess who this is? No? It's a contemporary painter by the name of Chuck Close. This is a painting in, uh, done in 1997. And what Chuck Close did was deconstruct the image even further by creating a grid system of color. So when you walk up close to it, they, it looks like blobs of circular color, but from afar, you can actually tell that it's a self-portrait. And finally, the third image here is a digital painting by artist Jonathan Thurston. And what he's done is take the avatar, which is the character that you have in the computer, and create a digital painting using Photoshop and one pixel per inch of color. This image is of how sculpture has been influenced by technology. On the left side, does anyone know that uh, artist who made this? Exactly. Very sharp student. Uh, Rodin, the thinker, okay, also in the 1800s, 1880. And on the right is a contemporary digital sculptor by the name of Barry Exball. It's a little bit scary, but uh, what he's done actually is use a 3D modeling software to sculpt the face of uh, the, I think it's one of the famous artists of 
uh, our contemporary sculptural uh, landscape, Matthew Barney. And with the digital technology, you can see that you can get a lot of detail. And he printed this using a rapid prototyping machine um, and then made it out of marble. This painting is a waterfall painting by a Japanese artist um, who used traditional Japanese painting uh, techniques to create a beautiful, a simple black and white piece. And I wanted to juxtapose that with an animation created by Carl Sims in 1988. And this was the first time a waterfall was uh, created out of a computer graphics animation. So I think it's important right now to define what art is, because we've seen a lot of different kinds of art. What is art? Is it something that is just visually pleasing and pretty? Or is it that weird, strange performance or video piece you see and you ask the creator, what is this? And they just say, it's art. You're like, okay. Well, what is it about a work that makes it artistic or an art creation? Well, this is a very difficult question to answer because art is not in written language. It is an experience. Art is of the sublime. It enters our consciousness from our senses, vision, touch, smell, memory, <clears throat> and it, it evokes an emotional and intellectual response. Instead of giving us straight up answers like a public announcement would, it provokes, stimulates, and makes the viewer ask questions. Successful artworks are aesthetically impactful emotionally engaging, and conceptually relevant to the human experience. So this image here is a very strange one. It's a performance piece documentation by Mariko Mori, who is a Japanese contemporary artist known for her futuristic works. And she's dressed as an alien serving tea to Japanese salarymen. So this image poses questions on us. Well, what does this say about culture, gender, roles that we play in society? Art takes a variety of forms, too. Not only is it drawing and painting 2D art, you have sculpture, installation, performance, video, animation, and with the rise of technology and the evolution of the internet, entirely new mediums we didn't have before, and genres of artworks that we haven't seen have risen, such as internet and software art, digital installations, virtual reality, digitally mediated performances, and on and on. And even edible and wearable art. Let's take a look at some edible art. video so I can speak over it. Uh, it's created by Jeremiah Tapin, who is a technology artist living in New York. And it's called Electronic Sandwich. You can't actually eat it, but it is very simple and elegantly created and very funny. And this was actually presented at some technology art conferences, and many people were laughing just like you. Um, this piece over here is created by Camille Scherer. Love it. Blood and wine. And it's just a little snippet of it, but it's wearable art. Okay. So art comes in many different forms. Now, I want to define what makes technological art, right? So we just defined and looked at what art is. So what makes technological art or digital art, new media, there are lots of different names to call this. Well, many new technologies 
could be mistaken for art, but they may just be gadgets or new supercomputers. We need artistic expression and concepts from the artist, the intention of the artist for it to become art. So we need both technology and art to be components to make it an artistic piece. OK, so where did it all come from? Well, some of you guys may know what this image is, because you've been all immersed in this symposium of technology. Does anyone know what this is? Yes, I, I think I heard uh, someone say it's the ENIAC, which is the very first computer, or known to be the very first computer, and it was 1946. So the influence of the rise of digital art or technological art comes from two things. One is the history and rise of technology. And two is the artistic movements during that time. So while technology was developing and we were going through a technological revolution, we were also going through many art movements. Now this is an image by a very famous French artist. Does anyone know who this is? Marcel Duchamp. So in 1917, Marcel Duchamp presented a urinal in a gallery, and it caused an uproar. People were used to seeing nice impressionistic paintings on the walls, and all of a sudden, there was a urinal in the middle of the gallery. Uh, it was shunned at that time, and he was kicked out of the salon, but he created a very interesting dialogue in the arts. This was the beginning of concept art, where you take the object-oriented art and make it about concept, about idea. Is this really art? Is it worth artistic value? It made us ask those important questions. And he also did the same thing with the wheel next to it. He took a very ordinary object, turned it upside down, and put it on a chair. This is the kind of art we look at and say, I can do that too. I can make that. But he was the first person who actually did this and put it in the gallery. And that's how he changed the game, of, uh, changed the rules of the game of art. So this is 1920. And this is TV cello, uh, created by an artist, Nam Jun Paik who is a Korean artist who really looked up to Marcel Duchamp. Um, so 40 years later, Nam Jun Paik, who is a pioneer of video art and television art, took TV and made it into an instrument. So we're like, huh, this is very strange. And they actually had a performance of this TV cello. And it didn't sound like a cello at all. But uh, what Nam Jun Paik did was take technology, this is called TV Garden, uh, and you have to remember uh, in 1960s, television was a very luxurious item. Not very many houses had it, and so it's almost like looking at the fastest computer. And what he did here with the TV Garden was he placed multiple TVs into the garden almost as if they were flowers or parts of nature. So already in the 60s, he was integrating synthetic technology with organic, natural environments. And we see that a lot today. So I wanted to juxtapose this and fast forward to 2009. And this is an, an animation created by a Japanese art group called WOW.
So, 50 years after Namjoon Pike's TV garden, now we have a garden that's made of mechanical, technological flowers and 3D animation um, and molecular structures made of, of technology. So uh, in the breakout session, I'm going to ask some questions about comparing the two forms. So I hope to see you all there so we can discuss that further. So with the so-called digital revolution now, what used to take us three days to research takes four seconds to research now. And most of us carry at least three computers on us at most times. And we can become experts at a field by watching YouTube videos. So this massive information exchange and ubiquitous computing has changed our visual landscape and art education and artists are being questioned and being asked to push the envelope and boundaries of art. What we used to have to go to galleries to see are now in our pockets. We can see museum shows, gallery shows from our smartphones. And on top of that, what we see in our visual landscape are environment, uh, I'm sorry, entertainment, gaming, even theme parks, and fashion. Those genres are employing uh, the artists of today to communicate. So we have a lot of visual elements going on, and it becomes more and more difficult to define what art really is. So this is the newest Bjork uh, DVD preview, and what Bjork has done is create software applications for every song that she's putting out on her CD or DVD. So you can download each song onto your iPhone as an app, and some of the songs you actually have to complete a level before you can finish the song. Has anyone installed the Bjork songs on their iPhone? It's free and it's called Biophilia, so please check it out. Not right now, but later. So uh, this is an example of a, a musician who is employing art and interactive technology into her work. She's very innovative. Art, artist. Okay, so does everyone know who this monster is, this creature? Gollum, right? Okay, um, I'm going to introduce you to two monsters of our time. Gollum is the first one. Now, when Gollum came out in Lord of the Rings, were you guys scared? No? <laughs> Were you guys in awe of the technology? We were probably not scared because it was in the realm of entertainment and we knew that it was part of a movie and part of a mythology. We knew he wasn't going to come out of the screen or come out of under our beds. Now that would be scary if we woke up and he was right next to our bed. But uh, uh, nevertheless, Gollum showed us what was possible with technology and 3D modeling, motion capture, and animation. And he scared me. This other monster that I want to introduce you to is Patricia Puccinini, who is a sculptor, one of her art pieces called The Surrogate. What do you guys think about this? Ew. Cute. Right, there's opposing forces here. It's cute, but it's gross. 
after, uh, I don't know if you can see in this image, but there are little babies in the back of this creature. <laughs> and this is a sculpture that exists in our real space. So you can go to a gallery and you can see it, and I don't think you can touch it, but if you wanted to and no one was watching, you could probably touch it. <laughs> now, this piece is uh, also a depiction of how far technology can take the sculptor. Using 3D modeling and rendering, you can really get the wrinkles, moles, the hair, and the scales on the back. I don't even know what that is. <laughs> uh, to make something that, for a moment, puts us in the world of make-believe. We're not sure if this thing really exists. It could exist. We live in a world of cloning, bioengineering, hybrids, mutation, and also mythology and uh, fictional writing. So we can walk into a, a gallery and see this, and for a moment we're like, <gasps> the hair on the back of our necks rise, and we viscerally feel like there's something strange going on in the room. Right? I don't want to be in the same room as this sculpture for very long. But the, the reason why I wanted to show you guys the two different monsters was to make you think about the vehicle of the message. One is entertainment and one is gallery art. Which is more powerful? And we can talk about that during the breakout session also. I, Speaking of the, about the environment, I'm going to move on to Jamie Allen, who is a performance artist. And this piece was actually in the Seagraph Asia art gallery that I curated. And he's a British artist, and he flew over to Japan and asked me to get a bicycle for him so he could set up his performance. Um, this piece is called Human Potential, and what Jamie has done is create technology and connect the power that he generates from riding a stationary bike, convert it into solar energy to light and basically make the lettuce that he eats grow. So it was a perfect cycle or system of sustainability. So for three days he didn't eat anything except this lettuce and then he rode his bike and ate his lettuce. And he had some water, too. By the end of three days, there was no lettuce left, and he couldn't go on any further. So as the concept, I think it's a very uh, perfect concept. But in reality, I don't think it's sustainable. So this is an image of lettuce. OK, this piece is created by a uh, installation artist named C.J. Huang, and he's a Taiwanese artist also living in New York, and he was also part of the show that I curated in Japan. And C.J. creates immersive installations using plastic bottles, computer fans, Tupperware, and video. So he uses lots of different mixed media, but uh, he creates these kinetic sculptures that move and breathe using plastic bags and uh, computer fans. So this is a video of the making of the installation and the installation itself. So the video actually turns on and off the motors of the fan that makes the, the, the creatures breathe.
uh, CJ actually creates these large-scale installations, and when you enter the room, it really feels like you're in an otherworldly space. And I, I wish that I could offer that experience to you guys, but you have to see it via video. So it's, it's not quite the same, but... Okay, so uh, this is the last piece I'm going to show you guys for the first part of the uh, presentation. Um, this is a still image from artist Steve Evans, and uh, he is an animator uh, living and working in Brooklyn. And uh, what he does is use the old traditional uh, genre of collage, but he also uses computer animation to uh, create his message. And can you guys recognize who's sitting on the camel in the middle? With this image, it might be difficult, uh, but you'll see in the, the animation I'm going to show you, uh, they are celebrity figures. So what he does is he creates this montage and kind of crowded collage and animation to depict different imagery about consumerism, war and terrorism, tourism, and just makes us question our role in, in the global political uh, state right now. So let's take a look at... part of this animation. We won't see the whole thing, but...
Artists for millennia have been the voice of civilization. Globally, we are exper experiencing a great shift in consciousness of social, economic, political, and environmental uh, states of being. As we are confronted moment by moment with global challenges such as natural disasters and terrorism. Simultaneously, there are rapid developments and advances in technology, creating multiple dimensions of existence that blur the boundaries of the real and the virtual. And there are faster and more ubiquitous ways of communi com communicating every day. So now more than ever, it is important for artists to express the authentic voice of what it means to be human today and to raise the important, relevant questions of our time. So that concludes the first part of the presentation. Um, and I'd like to show you a brief overview of the process that I have in my studio and uh, some of the things that I'm creating right now. So, uh, in my undergrad degree, I got a degree in philosophy and studio art. And in my studio art uh, uh, distinction exhibition at the end of the senior year, I had oil paintings of portraits. So for a long time, I was my background was in painting, and I was just painting people, which I found to be quite fascinating at the time. Um, five years later, I created this. Can anybody tell what this is made of? It's kind of hard to see. There's a detailed image. It's bubble wrap. So I went to a school of visual arts for a summer residency program, and I was painting portraiture on canvas. But when I went out to the streets of New York, I saw all this raw materials. It wood, plastic, garbage. People would throw away mountains of good raw materials that you could use. So at that time, I, it felt silly to me to be spending money buying canvas and painting portraits on it. I wanted to actually bring that raw material back to my studio and start using it. So that was the concept behind uh, how my work changed from painting into installation. And I also was teaching uh, children art. And as you probably all know, children love to transform things and make them into objects of play. So uh, the concept here is that I'm using bubble wrap and playing with it. Uh, this piece was created in 2000, and it's called Morning, um, as in good morning. And the, the installation is also a large scale installation. It filled my entire studio. Uh, and the walls and the ground are made of toilet paper, garbage bags, and the clouds are made of uh, sliced plastic bottles. So I was starting to use recyclable objects, uh, things that are normally discarded as trash, to create these environments and installations. Inside the middle of the room here, there's a a seven-person pool that I filled with water, so it's, it's kind of like a, a pond. And there's a, a floating sculpture in there as well. And this piece actually has a video component to it uh, of a performance of someone sinking into that water in the middle of the room. And uh, I started to naturally incorporate technology into my work. Uh, this is a sculpture of a cicada that I created out of Q-tips and toilet paper. You can see the detail of the Q-tips, the piece. 
the, my work was very experimental and still is. I created a uh, installation here where you can go up to the computer and turn on and off this motor that the, the insects were attached to. And it also made sound with this piece. In 2006, this is uh, after graduate school now, um, I became really fascinated with transforming organic forms in, into synthetic forms. So as you can see, this is a bumblebee approaching a bed of flowers. But everything here is created out of things that we dispose of. The bumblebee's body is made of uh, steel wool, and the legs are made of straws and Q-tips, and the wings are made of toilet paper, again. And the flowers are made of plastic bottles and sponge. So I was recreating nature with the byproducts of our consumer society. Uh, these pieces are using the same concept, but they're ladybugs made of house sponge. It, it also feels like some characters from some uh, family computer game, right? Like Mario Brothers or something. Uh, this piece was installed in a bookstore, and once again, it is following the same uh, theme and process. The butterflies are made of plastic bags, like shopping bags. And I also started to make some animation in my studio. So here's an example of a 3D animated work. shift gears a little bit and show you some of my drawings. Uh, this piece is called Burst, and what I've done here is take a single dandelion seed flower and abstract it. I 
thought that a, a dandelion seed flower was so <coughs> interesting of, of a form geometrically, but also it's very soft and ephemeral. So what I wanted to do was make it kind of explode as if it had a lot of energy in it and kind of uh, create a contrast between that soft texture and a hard explosion. So I've, with this piece here, this is uh, part of the burst series, uh, you can see that I've taken the dandelion form and abstracted it even more. And this is a collage as well as a drawing. So I'm using a lot of different mixed medias. And this piece is called Galactic Fields. And I was, I was <coughs> imagining the dandelion form as being these planetary forms in a galaxy. So this image here shows you the process that I took for the next couple of drawings that I'll show you. Uh, I went out to upstate New York and actually took photographs of the landscape. And I took still images from my animation that I just presented to you. And I used Photoshop to layer them and create a composition, which is all the way on your right. And so the end result is a drawing slash painting. I'm using both charcoal and paint. But the process goes from analog to digital, back to analog again. So this is another piece. Um, and I'm using the symbol of butterflies uh, because of their symbolism with Japanese mythology. <clears throat> if you want to hear more about it, please come to the breakout session. These are sculptural forms of butterflies, and they actually have roots attached to them. So with these sculptures, what I was imagining was the act of flying, but also being rooted, rooted into the ground. And I, I was thinking of this philosophical state of balance, where you're trying to fly, but you're actually rooted. So it's, it's called the impossible lightness of being. And uh, this is an example of using 3D modeling software and digitally printing the sculpture using a rapid prototyping machine. So uh, once again, using technology to create sculpture. And these last three images are the latest works that I, I just created last weekend. And the, the images are not very <coughs> high quality because I just took them with my uh, mobile phone, but I wanted to show it to you. <coughs> so this installation is a paper mache uh, igloo or tent type of room that I created. And inside, you get to play a video game of a butterfly flying. And you actually get to be the butterfly, use a joystick and foot pedals, and simulate flight. So this is a still image from the game. And you're the butterfly in the middle. And there's 3D elements of bumblebees, ladybugs, flowers in the background. And it, I, I see it almost as a response to the drawings and the sculptures that I've been creating. So um, in conclusion, what I want to stress to you is that it's really not about what technology you use. Um, it's about the ideas and the concepts behind the work. So you can use 3D animation. You can use sponge and make the same thing and, and create the, the message that you want to create. So thank you very much. And uh, have a nice day. I look forward to seeing you in the breakout session. Thank you very much, Professor Oda, for challenging us to see the experimentation in the art of the future, as well as the relevance uh, for this world today. Appreciate that very much. We have about five minutes for questions. 
So if anybody would like to come forward, we have microphones down in the front. We can take about three questions and then we have uh, breakout sessions. Uh, do remember that we have tremendous breakout sessions and then we'll all gather back here at two o'clock for the Green Lecture. But please uh, come forward first if you have questions for Professor Odom. Dr. Oda. Uh, so my name is Andrew R. McHugh. Uh, I am a junior here um, uh, is a philosophy mathematics major with a physics minor. Um, and my question is, uh, you mentioned that um, some of the modern art is moving from object-oriented to idea-oriented, and I was wondering if you could speak a few minutes on that. We'll speak more about it? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so when I say object-oriented art, I mean you look at the painting, uh, you assess its beauty, and perhaps you pay a price for it. So that's the traditional relationship that we've had with art. Uh, when I say concept-driven art, uh, the object actually provokes some kind of concept or idea, so the object itself may not be what the art is about. So. Uh, the example that I showed was the Marcel Duchamp piece with the, the urinal. The urinal itself isn't something that we all want to buy and, and show. Well, now we do because we really admire and value Marcel Duchamp's message. But back then, we thought of a urinal as something dirty and not something that you want to necessarily display in a gallery. So he was provoking us to think well, what is art? And is it a, an object that we think of as dirty, like a urinal, can that be an art object? So it made us ask those questions, and that was the concept of the piece. So um, when I say concept art or conceptual art, it's usually art that has a message or idea or or intention that goes beyond what's on the surface. Yes, you're welcome. Good question. Um, hi, my name is Joshua Kling. I'm a junior here, and I'm a biology major. And being a biology major, I was I'm very impressed with your art. I, I love the influences the natural world has on your work, and I think that's absolutely amazing. But my my question is, and in thinking about that piece you have, your abstract of the dandelion, in my mind I see that and that's absolutely amazing and it reminds me very strongly of the natural thing and kind of adds another sense of beauty to the natural form. But do you think this kind of art where you take a natural thing and you use an abstract on it, do you think that increases our appreciation of the actual aspect of the natural world? Or does it intend to create this disjointed idea where we see something, a beautiful piece of art that ex expresses something about the natural world, and then we go and actually see the thing, the, or the original, and feel a sense of disappointment and disconnect with that when we don't have that, always have that same emotional experience with the natural thing? Mm. Well, I think the interpretation is open for whoever views it. You may see it and think, wow, that's beautiful. That abstraction is amazing, and someone else might see it and not feel anything from it. So um, I think it's very, uh, I, I want it to be very open to interpretation. Um, and what I do is I actually observe and study a natural form. Like let's say I wanted to work on these ferns. I, I don't know if they're real, but <laughs> I would go to my studio, bring it, and draw it to understand it, and then I would abstracted almost by you know feeling and thinking about the natural energy of the form so um, I, I I'm glad that you think it's beautiful but uh, to me it doesn't really matter if the interpretation is a positive one or a negative one does that make sense
Hello, my name is Tim Aldred. I'm a freshman. I'm on McLeod. My, my question is mostly concerned with physical sculpture and using digital technology. Um, this is coming from a very layman's, layman's perspective, but if an artist uses digital technology to um, create and design their art, is that, and they're so assisted by it, is that, in a sense, cheating compared to like sculptures of like Michelangelo, Donatello? Well, a lot of artists who use analog ways of making, meaning making things with their hands, also use assistants to make their artwork. So some people think that that's cheating too, but they would still present their sculpture as Michelangelo. Um, I, I'm not really sure if Michelangelo had assistants, but I'm sure he had people who were artisans training with him. So um, that's a very good question. Now, for example, with digital technology, it's very easy to sculpt something and then digitally print it. Uh, I think that gallery buyers and owners are still having a hard time wrapping their mind around digital sculpture, for instance. And people are, many people are, are you know, willing to buy a sculpture made by hand, but they may not be willing to buy a sculpture made uh, printed with a digital machine. So uh, that's a very good question. And I think that my opinion is that it's not cheating. And that's because there's so much technology and tools that we have available to us. I think, you know, it's free for all. We should all use the, the tools that we need to create the vision that we have. Thank you very much. My name is Matt Murray. Uh, I teach English here, and I enjoyed your presentation very much. And uh, one thing that's that I remembered when you were talking about art, you said art uh, makes a viewer ask questions. And I was wondering, uh, what questions do you hope viewers ask when they see your art? With my work? That's a very good question. <laughs> well, it depends. It changes with the, the piece, because some of the pieces that I've created are very playful explorations and and my intention is just for the viewer to ex experience a space or experience flying um, but for example with the latest piece that I'm creating I actually make the, the participant the viewer participate by going into this weird installation or it's an enclosed space made of paper. So uh, what you find in it is a video game. And I think that, that by, by having the viewer experience that, they're asking questions about, OK, well, what is gaming? And also, in this game, you don't get to shoot anything or kill anything. You just experience and float through different um, otherworldly spaces. So. Uh, it may change the way someone thinks of what, what games are, really. So um, I think it might raise some interesting questions. But it really depends on the piece that, that I create. And each one um, may have questions that the other one doesn't. Thanks. This is the final question. Thanks. Hi, my name is Anna Bond. I'm a junior here. Um, I've done a little bit, I'm an English major, so I've, I've studied a little bit of Oscar Wilde um, and the aesthetic movement with art for art's sake. Do you believe that that's possible, that a piece of art can just be art, or is it um, inextricably linked to a human experience, and, like a message for our lives? So your question is, can art just be aesthetically beautiful? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> All right, thank you. Yes. With, with no other underlying meaning. Yes, I think so. Um, I think much of the art before concept art was just about uh, being aesthetically pleasing. So I consider those pieces to be art as well. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Great question also. Thank you all very much. Thank you.